Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. With that being said, before you guys sit down, let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we come before you, and Lord, through this Bible study, we ask that you would be our teacher. Father, I, I pray that through this Bible study, the students would walk away knowing, Lord, that you are hearing our every prayers, Father God. Lord, that they would walk away knowing that you will answer our prayers, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray that that would be a comforting thing to every student that is here, Father God. So Lord, we love you, and we thank you for giving us a great Heavenly Father who wants to bless us with the best, Father God. And so, Lord, these next 40 minutes, they're yours. Do whatever you want with them, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, go ahead and take a seat. The title of today's message is this, Come to the Gracious Father. Come to the Gracious Father. I specifically use that word gracious in my title for, that, for this very reason. By this point in your life, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's a cool little trick of when we think of grace and mercy, Grace for us is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And here in this text, we see what? We see that God, Jesus is telling us, hey, if you call out to your father who is in heaven, he's going to give you really good gifts. Now, I want you guys to note this. We don't deserve those gifts at all. Group in the back over there, please stop talking. Okay, let's lock it in. Um, we, don't, we don't deserve these good gifts. That's why we have, I, I titled it, We Have a Gracious Father. Now, we're going to be speaking about prayer today. I know a lot of us know how to pray, but specifically for today, we're going to be, t we're going to be touching on how God shows us how we are supposed to pray persistently and how we are supposed to expect an answer from God. When we pray, I want you guys to know that you guys can expect an answer from God as well. Now, praying, don't overcomplicate it, you guys, okay? It's a very easy, easy concept. It's us simply communicating with God. There's no need to overcomplicate it, okay? Praying is just us having a dialogue with our God who is in heaven. All of you guys, I believe, in here know how to, pr how to pray. You've probably gone to God and said something like this. God, this is what I'm facing right now. Can you help me out with it? Or you probably said, God, my family and I, we really need this. Can you provide for us? Or maybe you've gone to God and you've told him, hey, God, I'm really dealing with this emotion. I'm really struggling in this area. Can you help me get past this? That's you praying to God Almighty. And like I said, many of you guys already do this in your, in your life. And I encourage you guys to continue to um, put, put this into practice. But today... I hope that you guys leave with a better understanding of what prayer is and how Jesus instructs us from verses 7 through 11, how it is that we are to be praying. So the first point that I want to look at together is a persistent prayer. And we're going to see that in verse 7, a persistent prayer. So why don't you guys go ahead, for those of you guys that are taking notes, write that down. That verse 7 is going to show us how to be persistent in our prayers. For those of you that are not familiar with this word persistent, the first thing that, I, that comes to my mind because I grew up in this church is a big, mean pit bull. That's the first thing that I think of. Why? Because when a pit bull, it's said that when a pit bull goes to bite, whether it's another dog, sadly, or whether it's a human, or whether it's a toy, you know what? That pit bull is not going to let go. As soon as they latch on, they are persistent. They're tugging at you. They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to stay locked in. And so when I think of this word persistent, it means that I'm going to be determined to go to the goal. That's what, all that it simply means. Like I said, we're going to be looking at that in verse 7. Verse 7 tells us, Ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. This verse shows us the access that every Christian has in order for us, that every Christian has to, to be able to go to the Father. We all can go to the Father in prayer. We all can ask God for something. We all can seek God for guidance. And we all can go to God and say, Lord, I'm knocking at this door. Will you open it for me? When we lack something, we can say, we can ask God for it. When you're unsure of whether to go this way or that way, we can seek God and seek his direction. And when, honestly, for you guys that have had any opportunities in front of you, when you're looking and saying, God, I'm not sure if I should walk through this door or that door, but I'm knocking on both. Can you show me which one to go through? That's us being persistent in our prayers. Now, we need to pay attention to three key action words here. What are those words? They're ask, seek, and knock. At face value, when we see these words, they're just common words that don't really carry any meaning to them. But when you consider them in the Greek language, you're going to see how much more important these words are in the text. So I want to put those three words up on the screens. And as you guys can see, I have a definition for each one of those words. We're going to look at the word ask first. Ask in the Greek is a tale. It means to beg, to plead, to crave. And a good example of this is found in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 3. So I want you guys to keep that in mind, okay? The word ask, it means to beg, to plead, to crave. That second word seek in the Greek is to tell. It means to probe or the definition that I like more is to covet earnestly. To covet means that you really want something bad. Have any of you guys really wanted something bad before? That's what it's saying here that when we seek, when we seek God for an answer, it's like we want the answer so bad. And then that third word is this, knock. In the Greek, I don't know how to say that word in the Greek, I'm not going to lie. But it means to hammer or to pound. The way that I like to look at it is like this. If there, I used to live in East LA. It was pretty ghetto down there. But if one day there was a drive-by and I was somewhere that was pretty far away from my house, but there was someone's house that was close by, man, I would run to that person's house as soon as I heard those gunshots. And what is that person going to rightfully do? They're going to lock their doors. They're going to close all of their doors. But if I see an opportunity to get into, you know, behind, behind their coverage, behind their doors, behind their walls, I'm going to go up to those doors. I'm going to be like, boom, 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 boom. Like, let me in. Dude, they're shooting behind me, you know. And that's the picture that we are to have when we pray. When we go to God and we don't know exactly what, what door to walk into, we're to say, Lord, I'm knocking on this door. I'm hammering on this door. Is this the one that you would have for me? So do you guys see that these, putting, putting the definitions and what they mean in the Greek brings a whole lot more richness into, the, into these verses. So with the help of the original language, we can now read this verse like this. Follow along with me. I'm going to change verse 7 and, put, and insert the definitions into it. It says, Come beg or plead, and it will be given to you. Covet earnestly, and you will find. Hammer on that door, and it will be opened. This should be our attitude towards prayer. This shows that we are being persistent with our prayers. I think many times, both you and I were guilty of not going to God with this attitude because of our pride, perhaps, or it actually could be that we don't have the right understanding of who God is. We don't see God in the right light. Remember, we have a good heavenly father who loves us. If for any reason you've forgotten that, listen to this next verse that we're going to see in Psalm 116, okay? Psalm 116, go ahead and write that down so that for you guys who think to yourselves, you know what, God is far off. He's not listening to my prayers he doesn't, he doesn't pay attention to what's going on, going on in my life. I want you guys to take Psalm 116 home with you guys because it paints a great picture of God when we pray to him. Psalm 116 verses 2 to 4 says this, I love the Lord because he hears my voice. 
and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Imagine that, you guys. He's painting a picture of God coming down to our level to hear us out like a father would to his small child. Remember when you guys were a little bit smaller and, God, and your parents would come down to you and say, okay, what's going on, buddy? The psalmist is giving us an image of, of that, that when we pray, when we call out to God, God doesn't stay in his high throne. He, he comes down to our level and he says, hey, what is it that's heavy on your heart right now? Or what is it that you're praying through? God wants you to come to him with everything that is in your life. Don't forget that. And we can do that through prayer. We have access to God through prayer. Now, going back to these three important words, ask, seek, knock. I want you guys to learn something else about these words. These three words in the original Greek language are in the present imperative. Now, I know that's a big, fancy word, but we're going to go ahead and break it down so that you guys get more understanding about what, what it is that we're talking about here, okay? In school, what do you learn? Your verbs can be in the present tense, right? Give me, give me a head your, shake your head as a yes if this is true. In school, you learn the present tense, you learn future tense, and you learn past tense. Now, here's another one that, is ver- that was very common to the Greek language, and it is the present imperative. If you guys look at the definition that I provided for you, it's a command not only to do a thing once, but to go on and do it for, for however long it is that you're going to be alive indefinitely. So an example of this that I have for you guys is, is this, okay? Track with me. If I were to say to you, hey, wash your hands because, because you have dirt underneath your nails and you're about to eat. That command, which is the word wash, is specific to that moment. It's specific to that instant. Now here's, here is that same sentence, but now it's in the present imperative. And you guys are going to see how, oh, okay, I see the difference between both of these things. If I were to say to you, don't forget to always wash your hands before you eat. The word wash in that sentence is not only referring to that specific instance, but also to any other time that you are about to eat. Does that make sense, you guys? So if you guys, if we were having a fellowship feast right now, and you were going to dig into the pizza, and I saw that someone had like this, you know when people have like uh, dirt underneath their nails? And I were to tell them, dude, go wash your hands, man. You're not going to touch this pizza, okay? That's, that command is specific to that one event. So he knows, okay, I'm going to wash my hands because my for the, because I'm, we're at the fellowship feast. But if your parents, if your mom, most of us have heard this from our parents, tell us, hey, before you eat, always remember to wash your hands. Now you know, okay, I'm going to wash my hands any time in the future from this point forward that I'm ever going to eat. So do you guys see the difference between those two scenarios? That's what the present imperative is. So why do we need this little Greek lesson for today? It is simply because of this. Because now that you've learned, you can add even more meaning to this verse. Instead of praying one time and never praying about something again, we learn that Jesus is actually teaching us that when we pray, we are to ask and keep on asking. We are to seek and to keep on seeking. We are to knock and keep on knocking. I know that in the English language it says, you know what? I'm just going to seek one time, and boom, I want the answer, right? But that's not how it works. God, in this text, he's, he wants you, he's teaching us. He's teaching his disciples, be persistent. Be like that pit bull, okay? Annoy God. You know how when you really want something, and you go to your parents, and you kind of like bring it up like, hey, have you put any more thought about getting me that iPad? <laughs> have you put any more thought about, you know, um, letting me go to Johnny's house? Right? You kind of annoy them until they give you, an answer. And that's how we are to, supposed to be with God. We're supposed to tell God, you know what, God? I'm looking for the answer. I'm searching for the answer. Can you help me out? And as I was going through the study, the application portion, I was thinking to myself, why would this be important to a junior higher? Why is it important that you guys learn to be persistent in your prayers? The first thing is because Jesus simply told us in this text that we're looking at today. 
But the second thing, the second reason why I think this is important for you guys is because of this. Because of the world that you and I grew up in. We live in a world where everything is instant. Everything is fast. We order something through Amazon. Guess what? It's there the next day, right? On our front, on our front steps. And we're just like, wow, that was fast. Everything is fast in our world today. And if anything buffers... If anything lags while you're playing video games, if anything slows down, then you, think, then you guys grow weary. You guys get discouraged like, oh man, why is it going so slow? But God is telling you guys, hey, I want you guys to be persistent. When we pray, I know that the temptation is this, you guys, look. The temptation is, okay, Lord, I'm praying for this thing, I'm praying for this thing, I'm praying for this thing. And you, you can do it with your eyes closed. And then boom, boom. You open your eyes and you're like, okay, God, what's the answer? I'm ready for the answer. Give it to me. That's the temptation, right? Because of the world that we live in, where everything is fast. And yet, God is slow to move in our lives for this very reason, okay? Because, yes, you might be praying a certain direction. You might be saying, Lord, this is what I want. This is what I feel this best. But guess what? God has the very best option for you in store. And if you stay persistent if you stay faithful, if you stay patient in your prayers, then he's going to lead you to that point. A quick illustration about this is, think of Little Caesar's Pizza. What is their motto? I know it's pizza pizza, right? They they say that in the commercials. But at the same time, it's also hot and ready. You can get a pizza for $5 and it's hot and ready. Now, side note, every time that I've gone to Little Caesar's, they're never hot and ready, okay? There's always a long line. But that's their motto, right? It's hot and ready. And that's kind of how we want our prayers sometimes, where it's just like, you know what, Lord? I need it now. I need it quick. But I remember I went to this uh, restaurant in Rancho one time, and they had this cute little sign that said this. It said, be patient. Your food will be out shortly. This, the the food was not frozen. Everything is handmade. And sometimes our, our prayers are like that. Sometimes the plan that God has for us, they're in that way, where it's like, hey, be patient. Stay faithful to God. And then what God ultimately wants you to walk into, which is going to be the best plan, the best option, you'll get there eventually, okay? But I know that we lived and we we grew up in this world where everything is fast, everything is, we need it in the here and the now. But not everything that is quick is good. Remember that, okay, you guys? That not everything that is fast, not everything that comes to us in a moment is good. My encouragement for any of you students that are here today is this. If you yourself find yourself seeking the Lord for something, if you yourself are in here and you're saying, you know what, Lewis, I've been praying for a few days now. I've been praying for a few months now. I've been praying for a few years now. And it doesn't seem like God has answered my prayers. Well, I want to encourage you guys in here to keep on praying to him because he is going to bless you with the very best because he's good to us. One of my favorite quotes regarding prayer, and I think I have it on the screens for you guys, is this. I want you guys to hear this out, okay, for those of you guys who might find yourself in that situation. God is rarely early. He's never late, but he's always on time. Think about that, you guys. God is rarely early. He's never late, but he's always on time. Meaning that when we get to that point where we're just like, oh, I'm so defeated. There's no way that the outcome is going to be exactly what I thought it was going to be. Then God, boom, he shows up in that very moment. Why? Because he's never late. He's our good heavenly father, and he wants to take care of each and every one of you guys. So take that to heart for those of you who are in that season of praying for something. Listen, I, I grew up with a family, seven sisters. I grew up with my parents. Um, none of them are walking in the ways of the Lord right now, sadly. But they are my mission. And ever since I became a Christian back in 2017, I started praying for them. I started saying, Lord, I don't want to go to heaven and see my family go to hell. So I'm going to start praying for them. And you know what? It has been a little discouraging at times where I'm just like, Lord, they're getting so close. They're getting it, but they just don't make that commitment. But my job isn't to worry about what the the work that the Lord is doing in their hearts. My job, what God is calling me and what we see in this text, is to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. I've been praying for them for years now, since 2017. How many years is that? Three, uh, seven years total, right? 
and none, not one of them have repented, but I'm still praying for them. And that's how you guys are supposed to be with your prayers. You guys are, are supposed to be persistent with your prayers. And God, he will answer your guys' prayer. Our second point in this is going to be from verses 8 to 11. And that second point is an answered prayer. Why don't you guys go ahead and write that down for those of you that are taking notes. Go ahead and take a moment to write that. Let's go ahead and read verses 8 through 11 here. It says there, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Look, there's a guarantee that our prayers are going to be answered. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Could you imagine that? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? I do not want a snake. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, the, your, will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? As we go into this section, I want to make a quick distinction about that word, everyone. If you guys remember, Pastor Colin, last week, he, gave a, he made a brief note to you guys saying that when we read the Bible, we have to take into consideration the verses that are around it so that we have the right context. I want you guys to remember that today because a lot of people in the world would say, hey, I'm included in the everyone. God is going to answer my prayers if I ask, if I seek, and I knock. But there's a distinction that needs to be made before we proceed in this very um, point. I want you guys to write down that everyone includes all of those that Jesus has been referring to up until this point in the Sermon on the Mount. During this sermon, Jesus is talking to, he's not talking to the atheist, he's talking to the believer. He's talking to those who belong to him. God, he's not going to answer a prayer that a Buddhist sends up to him, right? He's just not going to do that. Why? Because that Buddhist doesn't belong to him. Now, I will say this before you guys start saying, oh, well, what if that Buddhist is asking for salvation? Well, if that Buddhist is asking for salvation, then yes, God will answer their prayer. And guess what? Then that person is going to belong to God. He's going to become one of his children. As I'm saying this, maybe you guys are taking inventory in your own mind where you're thinking to yourself, man, do I belong to God? Do I belong to God? If the answer is, hey, I'm not sure, or if you know plain and simply that no, I do not belong to God, why don't you guys make that decision today? God will ha would have you guys to become one of his children starting today. Sometimes we try to put it off and say, hey, I'll, I'll get right with God later on. Well, the fact of the matter is that you can probably, I don't want this to happen, but in the parking lot, if someone's, if someone's raging because someone got mad that they cut them off and they gas it and they happen to T-bone you at your side of the car, you're up in eternity with God. So I want you guys to take inventory and ask yourself, do I belong to God? Because those people that belong to God are the people that are included in this word, everyone, that we see in verse 8. In verse 8, we see that when we ask, we will receive. When we seek, we will find. And when we knock, the door will open. That is awesome. I take comfort in that verse. This shows us that there's a guarantee that our prayers will be answered. Now, here's the big question. Here is the big question. Will God always answer our prayers in the way that we expect him to? I see some of you guys' heads shaking no. And I see some of you guys still talking on this side, but I don't want to call you guys out. I have a little pop quiz for you guys, okay? It's a simple game of true and false. Up here, I'm going to put up two statements. The first statement is this. Prayer is a way for Christians to change God's mind. I don't want you guys to answer out loud, but in the quietness of your own heart, I want you guys to think to yourself, is this true? Do I believe this? Or is this false? Prayer, that prayer is a way for Christians to change God's, God's mind. The second thing is this. Prayer is a way for Christians to get on the same page with God's plan. Is that true or is that false? Think about that. The first statement is false. For those of you guys that don't know, prayer is not a tool for us to be able to change God's mind. 
The second statement that I put up there, that one is true. That prayer is a way for us as Christians to get on the same page as God. You see, sometimes when we pray, our prayers start over here. Look at me up here. They start over here when God's will is over here. And as we continue to pray and pray and pray and pray for them, we move, we move closer to what God would have us to do. And we get in alignment with him. We, we, we get on God's plan, and then we walk on that plan. And as we pray for things in our lives, we make different shifts. It's not always a straight line. It's not always a one and done type of situation. We make shifts. We make different turns as we go. And if you're anything like me, this is how it usually goes for me. You know, I'll start with something, an opportunity that's in front of me, and I'll say, Lord, this is the opportunity that's in front of me right now. What would you have me to do with it? I want you guys to note this. When you become a Christian, yes, you accept Jesus as, as Savior of your life, but having him as Lord of your life means that you're going to include him in every single thing that is presented to you. So in my thought process, it usually starts like that, where it's like, okay, I have this option. I have this opportunity. Lord, what would you have me to do with it? Then it usually goes to something like, Lord, it looks like this opportunity is the right one. Is this the one that you want me to follow through with? Is this where you would have me to go? And then eventually I get to a place where I realize I'm a knucklehead and I had it all wrong from the start. And I say to myself, you know what, Lord, I see why you had me wait this long. It's because you wanted me to get to your perfect will. And I eventually get there. But guess what? There's a lot of shifts. There's a lot of turns before I even get to that place. And as we pray, we learn, to, we learn to be okay with those different turns and those different shifts that God puts in our life because he will ultimately get us to where we need to be. And that's the most important place for us to be. To get a better, better understanding of what I mean by this, let's go ahead and look at John chapter 15, verses 7 through 8. This is the famous chapter of God being the vine and we are the branches, right? So John chapter 15, 7 through 8 says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Why do I bring up this verse? Because in John 15, Jesus tells us that when we abide with God and when God's word abides in us, we will get what we desire. The amazing thing about this is that the more we read our Bibles and the closer we draw to God, the more okay we are with God leading us in whatever direction he would have us to go. So it's a simple formula here, okay, you guys? The closer that you make yourself to God, the more that you study and read the Bible, the more God's desires are going to be revealed to you, and in turn, his desires are going to become your very own desires. And isn't that where you guys want to be? You guys want to have the same desires that God has. You guys want to purpose on your heart, Lord, what are the things that are important to you? And the more you read, the more that you abide with him, the, the closer that you are with him, you'll get to that point. Verses 9 through 11, they tell us that not only does God answer our prayer, but he will also give us the best. He will also give you guys the best. Verses 9 through 11 say this, okay? Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here we see this kind of dynamic, if you guys pick up on it. There's a dynamic, dynamic between a father and a son that we see here. Um, they both, both questions that we see in, in these verses illustrate a human's ability to give good gifts. You see that part where it says being evil? Think of your parents. Next time they give you something good, be like, hey, you're evil, but you, pretty, you, did, you outdid yourself this year at Christmas when you gave me this PlayStation, you know? And you call them evil because that, and be like, hey, that's what Matthew says. That's what Matthew says in the Bible, right? He makes a point that even a dad wouldn't give their kids rock when that kid goes to ask the dad for bread. Jesus then makes the second point in here, and he says that even an earthly dad wouldn't give a kid a serpent 
when the kid asks for fish. Think of this, think of it like as if it's your birthday. Some of you guys have birthdays coming up, and you guys tell your parents, you know what, Dad? You know what, Mom? This year I want to go to the yard house. I want to get the best meal ever. And then guess what? Come your birthday, they're like, all right, you guys ready for dinner? Boom, big bowl of beans. Now, I know that not everyone can necessarily make it to the yard house or afford it, but you guys get what I'm saying, right? Um, it wouldn't be nice. That, that wouldn't be the best gift that your earthly father is giving you. Or the same thing goes for this. If you guys ask for a puppy and your parents come back and they say, look, I got this earthworm for you and I put it in a little case for you. And it's just like, oh, you got me a pet, right? I guess, but that's not really what I wanted. And yet Jesus is telling us here, look, if our fathers who are here on earth are able to give you guys good gifts, imagine how much better the gifts that are going to be from our father who is in heaven who is perfect, who is not tainted. The main takeaway from verses 9 through 11 is this. Jesus is communicating to us that if our earthly fathers who are tainted and fall short daily can give us good gifts, imagine how much greater the gifts from our heavenly father will be. Now, we move on to verse 12. Verse 12 is going to bring us to our third point for today. Go ahead and write down the third point, and that is the golden rule. Many of you guys, as we unpack this, are going to be reminded, you know what? I know a little bit about this. I've heard, I've heard this ideology before. Let's go ahead and read verse 12. It says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of and the prophets. As we look at this final verse, you might notice that this verse is a little bit out of place. Look, Jesus goes from talking about prayer, 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 how we are to be persistent in prayer, how he will answer our prayers, and then he drops this like nuke on us, right? Where it's just like, whoa, where did this come from? It came out of left field. Because he's now talking about, hey, this is where you're doing something. This is the action portion of it. Although this verse might seem like it's out of place, I want you guys to really take into consideration two things about this. The first thing that I want to point out to you guys is when you guys look at your Bibles, look at my pretty Bible. It's very pretty, huh? And guess what? I got it for free. I found it in the high school room. Someone left it there for months, and I was like, okay, Lord, uh, you're showing me that this is the Bible that you would have for me. So I took it. And that kid never came to look for it, okay? But I... The reason I bring this Bible up is because you guys see all of the headers that are in there. Mine are in red. You guys see all of the headers, all the verses, how they're numbered, how they have the chapters and whatnot. Guess what? All of that stuff is actually not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Men added that into the Bible to make it easier for us to be able to refer to certain areas that are in the Bible. Did you guys know that? So that's not inspired. I want to make that distinction, okay? And the second one that I want you guys to know is this. When Jesus taught, when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, it's not like, he's not like me and Tay and all these pastors that you see around here where he has his notes, right? He wasn't like that. Jesus, often when he spoke, when he taught his disciples, he would teach from the heart. He would speak freely about the things that were in his heart. And if it wasn't something that was from the heart, it would be something that would be brought up to him, right? Hey, what, sh what do you think about marriage? Hey, what do you think about fasting? So they were subjects that were brought to him. So I want you guys to note this, that as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, you guys need to know that Jesus, he doesn't have this structure. So he, now we see here in verse 12 that he's moving on to the next idea, that he's leaving this idea of prayer behind and he's moving on to the next one. So as we see here, considering both of those points, when we look at verse 12, though it might seem out of place, this is what was on Jesus' mind to teach next. Verse 12 describes something that is like the golden rule of society. On the screen, you guys can go ahead and see that what the world says versus what the Bible says. There's two things here. The world says, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Um, you guys have probably heard of that. The Bible says, do unto others 
what you would want done to you. There's a big difference in those two statements, although they sound really similar. One's inactive and one's a passive. Both ideas are different because one side says, hey, be passive. Stay in your own lane. Stay in your own bubble. Don't bother anyone. And that way, you're not going to ruffle any, any feathers. You're not going to rub anyone the wrong way. That's what the world says. But Jesus challenges you and I to what? To be active in our faith, to live out our Christianity. He challenges us to actively love people. For you guys, that can simply be mowing the lawn for your neighbor. That can be taking out their garbage uh, cans every week. That can be you picking up um, their pet's poop, maybe in from the yard. Maybe they're a little elderly. I know not a lot of you guys would volunteer to do that. That can be you guys washing their car because you're actively loving your neighbor, right? And that's the goal that Jesus would have for us. He doesn't want you guys to be like, okay, I'm going to stay in my house all day. I'm not going to interact with my neighbors, and I'm just going to do me, and that way I don't bother them. He doesn't want you guys to think that way. He doesn't want you guys to be passive. He wants you guys to be actively loving other people. And the Bible makes it clear that Christians will be known by their love for one another. John 13, 34 to 35. Go ahead and write that verse down. Because here is where the Bible tells us, hey, if you want to find out that you are a true Christian, this is the mark of the Christian right here. John 13, 35 to 34. Oh, sorry, 34 to 35. Jesus says here, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. God is calling us to be active with our walks, with our, with our walks in Christianity. He wants you guys to actively love other people. He doesn't want you to, feel, to follow the, what the world says, but he wants you to fi- follow what verse 12 is telling us here. And the second thing that I would like to point out in verse 12 is the word, therefore. Now, you guys, junior high ministry, some of you, is seven, you're in seventh grade, some of you guys are in eighth grade. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this, but I'm going to say it for the sake of everyone. Whenever you see the word, therefore, you are supposed to ask yourself, why is it therefore? I see Linda go like this, meaning that Linda already knows what I was going to say, you know, because she's doing her little hand movements over there. But it's good for you guys to learn that, okay? When you see the word therefore, ask yourself, why is it therefore? Usually it's a word that means in light of what was just said in the prior verses. It summarizes everything that was said previously in these verses. But I think that this, therefore, this one specifically that we see in verse 12, is taking into account not only the verses that we just studied today about prayer, but it's also taking into consideration all of what we've been learning on the Sermon on the Mount. Meaning that from the start of chapter 5 up until this point, Jesus is bringing it all to one big summary. And he's saying, look, in light of everything that was just said, not just verses 7 through 11, but everything starting at chapter 5, He's saying, this is what I want you to do. Through our time studying the Sermon on the Mount, we've looked at different topics. Now, I don't know if I have the list of the different topics that we looked at. This would be helpful for you guys. I I wrote down a few of them. But you can see that chapter 5 starts off with what? With the Beatitudes. Then he talks about, Jesus teaches on, okay, we are to be the salt of the earth. He then talks about loving our enemies. Then about fasting. Then about learning how not to worry. Then he talks about, hey, there is a right way to judge your brothers and be a fruit inspector. In conclusion to all of this, I want you guys to know that apart from the help of the Holy Spirit, none of us in this room would be able to accomplish anything that is on that list. You start off looking at the book of Matthew, or to start off in the ch- chapter 5 of Matthew, You read all of those B attitudes, and guess what? None of us in this room would ever be able to fulfill or meet those those, um, goals without the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus teaches, teaches us that we need to ask 
and pray God for one key thing in our life. And that is the Holy Spirit. Because the, th- the key thing for the believer is the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. This study, as we conclude here, it's taught us that, <clears throat> that we can go to our gracious Father in prayer. That when we pray, we are to be persistent. We are to expect God to answer our prayers. And ultimately, as a Christian, you need to ask God for the most important thing, and that is the Holy Spirit. In closing here, I want to put up two verses. I want to put up Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, which we looked at today. And I also want to put Luke's version of this as well, which is Luke eleven thirteen. And I want you guys to notice this, okay? We already know what this message has said. Look over here. It says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? But hear what Luke says. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts? No, it doesn't say good gifts. It says give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Because that right there is the best gift that we can ever receive from God. We need the Holy Spirit in order for us to be Christians. And so as you ask God, as you seek, as you knock, make sure that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Because I'll tell you guys what, like I said, none of us would be able to accomplish everything that has been said since the start of chapter 5 up until this point without the help of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, yes, is known as the Comforter, but Jesus said that when he departs from this world, that he was going to send us the helper. The helper to what? To be able to live a godly life. To live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. To live in a way that is holy, that is set apart from the rest of this world. And with that, you guys, I just want to share this last thing, okay? I know that for myself, I wouldn't be the person that I am today if I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me. Maybe you guys are already taking your relationship with the Lord seriously. Maybe not. But I'll tell you what. You can fake it to a certain extent. But in order for you to actually be walking with God and according to his plan, you need the Holy Spirit. So learn this, you guys. Learn to ask God because he's gracious. Learn to seek direction from him. And learn to knock at those doors to see which doors he would open in your guys' life. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we come before you, Father God, and we just thank you that you're there for us, that you love us as your children. And Lord, this, these verses today have opened my eyes to really think to myself, you know what? If my parents here on earth can get me good things, how much greater are those things that you have waiting for us, Lord God? And so, Father, I just pray that for the junior high students that are in here, Lord Jesus, that they would learn to be patient that they would learn to be obedient so that they can walk in in accordance to your plans, Father God. So, Lord, we love you that you love us in this way. We thank you that we can pray to you at any moment, Lord God, and that you hear us, Father God. So, Lord, go before us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.